We are come together that we might be with God. He made us and saved us, and we see him in one another. We are glad to see you. Members one of another, let us come together honestly to tell God that we have not lived as he desires, and let us ask him because of Jesus Christ to forgive us. We have become less than he wanted us to be and have misused and abused his creation. O oh God, we have not fulfilled the hope in which you made us. Our thoughts and words and deeds have not been good. Only you can help us. Even as you came to our world in Jesus Christ, come to us now. God our Father cares about us. He did give Jesus Christ to us, and it was because of us that Jesus died. Now in faith we can be sure that all is well again between God and us. Those who believe receive the power to become the very sons of God, and God lives in them. Those who believe and are baptized will always be with God. Help this to happen to all of us, O God. O oh Lord, I have trusted in your goodness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he has been generous with me. How long will you forget me, O oh Lord? How long will you hide your face from me? Let us talk to God. Let us ask for his peace and for the right to be with him at all times. Let us ask that there be peace in the world and that his churches may do his will and that divisions may end. Let us ask God to be here and to help those who are sincere and honest as they come here to be with him. Help us, save us, pity and defend us, O God. Glory be to God on high.
God be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose strength is not impaired and whose will is not deterred by the foolishness nor weakness of man, help us, particularly in times of crises, to trust in you and look for your intentions, that we may find the courage to do good and to live in love and peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end.
The Old Testament lesson is recorded in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, beginning with the fourth verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and goodly cities, which you did not build, and houses full of all good things, which you did not fill, and cisterns hewn out, which you did not hew, and vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take heed, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and swear by his name. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. The epistle lesson is recorded in 1 John, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 16th verse. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. In this is love perfected with us, that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we to be in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and he who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says he loves God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God should love his brother also. Here ends the epistle for today. The gospel is recorded in the 16th chapter of Luke, beginning with the 19th verse. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, full of sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, 
lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Here ends the gospel for this day. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. To this, the first event in the commencement exercises of this day, we bid you all a most cordial welcome. I want to call attention to the fact that the beautiful flowers on the platform are in memory of a man who was a part of this institution for 35 years, and this would mark the 100th anniversary of his birth, Dr. Andreas Helland. We appreciate this floral tribute from his family. Then I want to call your attention to the other events of the day and welcome you to these, and then a word about the offering this morning, which will be used to support three projects here at Augsburg College, Project Friendship, involving nearly 100 Augsburg students who spend several hours each week with disadvantaged children from Adams and Irving Elementary Schools, the FAME program, which provides financial aid for minority students at Augsburg, and the Commission on Religious Activities project to improve worship facilities and purchase materials necessary for the advancement of religious life on our campus. I invite your participation in the offering, which follows the sermon this morning. We continue our service with the hymn, Lord by Whose Breath, and you will notice the various sections of the hymn and participate accordingly.
have requested that the fans be kept on during the sermon because with the implementation of electronic equipment, I'm sure that you can hear me and we can be the more comfortable. Dear friends in Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My text this morning is taken from the 15th chapter of St. Luke. And he said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took his journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish here with hunger? But I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, And bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and make merry, for this my son was was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to make merry. To me, there have always been two important lessons in this story of the waiting father. First, the father took his son back when he came home. The second, he let his son go when he wanted to leave. The first is an important message to children. The second is a very important message to parents. But it is not these that I want to talk about this morning. Rather against the background of this past year, it is the pivotal point in between these two events which attracts my attention today. That pivotal point is succinctly stated in a few brief words. When he came to himself. When he came to himself, the moment of truth, when he confronted his own conscience, when he took a square look at himself sitting there in the pig pen, hungry, lonely, disgusted, but with the memory of home, at that moment there was hope for him. Without that experience of a conscience confronted and a moral decision forged, there would have been no return, no resolution, no homecoming. There is no time here to argue about conscience, either psychologically, sociologically, or theologically. Regardless of how we may view it, conscience remains a given. Because whenever we are moved to say, this is wrong, or we are wrong, or more importantly, I am wrong. The ability which marks us as human beings to distinguish between good and evil asserts itself, and for better or for worse, we call it conscience. For this wayward son, conscience was of no consequence until he became educated by the memory of what used to be, by an assessment of what was actually the case, and by a comparison between the present condition and the way things were intended to be. Out of just such a learning experience came a moral decision and action in a new direction. What has all of this to do with you, the class of 1970, who now complete your sojourn here at Augsburg College? For four or five years, as the case may be, you have lived through one of the most momentous periods in the history of any college generation. Historians will spend decades recounting and examining what happened at Selma, 
Detroit, Memphis, Los Angeles, Chicago, Vietnam. Chronicles of higher education will recall Berkeley, Columbia, San Francisco State, Cornell, Harvard, Kent State, not merely as a list of various educational institutions, but battlegrounds in a decade of unprecedented change, upheaval, protest, revolution, and polarization. But to dwell on these events and kindred occurrences in assessing this student generation which you represent is like telling the story of the prodigal only in terms of squandered property, loose living, swine, pens, and pig food. There is much to describe and more to abhor, but the point could be missed in all of this. Something strangely significant and positive has taken place. What we have witnessed during your student generation is the recovery of conscience. In a society rolling in affluence, trained to the teeth, in technological skills, glorying in scientific accomplishments which stagger the imagination, and armed with overkill that could destroy humanity, the still small voice of conscience is penetrating the din of a million cars, the scream of a thousand jets, the blast of spaceships, and the deadly racket of war. A still small voice saying, Something is wrong, terribly, terribly wrong. And when we pause long enough to ponder that something is wrong with mankind, with us, with me, conscience is not dead. In fact, it has been sensitized and activated most effectively by your student generation. It is you more than any other segment who are making us, society, come to ourselves by insisting sometimes raucously, sometimes imprudently, and even impudently, that this is not the way matters are intended to be, that life has come to a pass which makes it meaningless and intolerable, that we are perishing by virtue of our folly, you have come, you have become the most morally concerned generation in the history of our country, that you have become inflicted and diseased by the moral squalor of our times is not to your credit, even though you have had not, not had much help in keeping morally and spiritually healthy. Responsibility even for you is the prerequisite of conscience, and conscience is what marks us as human. Nevertheless, no generation has said more clearly and more often, there is something fundamentally and morally wrong. You are right. It is wrong to dehumanize students by an educational process that form, uh, forces them into sausage casings and turns them out like Peter's poor cats. You are right. It is wrong to slavishly indulge our materialistic appetites when things and clothes and haircuts don't make the man. You are right. It is wrong to wallow in plenty when millions worry in poverty. You are right. It is wrong to deny fundamental human rights and basic human dignity to a man because of the color of his skin. You are right. It is wrong to make success in war the criterion for determining national honor. You are right. It is wrong to assume that our nation has the right to force its will on another country. You are right. It is wrong to accept pollution as an alternative to purity and exploitation of nature as more acceptable than trusteeship. You are right. It is wrong to bring children into the world that, when they cannot be given a fair chance for a decent life. You are right. It is wrong to make the needs of a military machine more important than the needs of human beings. It is my contention that the conscience of society has seldom been as disturbed as it is today, thanks to the fact that on most issues this student generation taken as a whole, even with an admixture of radicals at both ends of the spectrum, is fundamentally right in declaring what is wrong. And if this is stated, 
not in pharisaical self-righteousness, as is sometimes the case, but in the sheer realization that I and you perish here with hunger, the turning point may be at hand, as it was for the young man in the story when he came to himself. I repeat, the student generation you represent has contributed mightily to the education of society's conscience in spite of excesses and overstatements. Just such a stricken conscience is essential for any kind of renewal of the spirit within. There is no road back until this dead end of our acknowledged bankruptcy is reached. I perish here. Indeed, we perish here with avarice. We perish here with racism. We perish here with militarism. We perish here with chauvinism. We perish here with pollution. But when conscience backs us in the corner, a moral decision to do the right thing or the wrong thing becomes absolutely imperative. Conscience brings us to the crossroads. No attitudinal changes in people or societies have taken place without the prerequisite of a disturbed conscience. This is not simply true in the case of individuals. It is likewise the case where groups of people and whole societies have become stricken in conscience over a social issue. And out of this have come fundamental changes in both personal and societal attitudes. Dr. Carl Olson, the president of North Park College, referred to one example in a letter which he wrote to his constituency. He referred to the conditions in Sweden in the first part of the 19th century, when intemperance and drunkenness had so taken hold of the nation that even the youth and the children were being affected. And suddenly the conscience of the nation rose up to do something about a social issue, and out of that came one of the great religious revivals in that country in the early 1900s. Because of the moral crisis we are experiencing, I believe there are great and glorious possibilities for the gospel, the good news. For what needs to be heard is that there is above all of this and above everything else, love, acceptance, and joy in the heart of the Father and that we can, with our guilty consciences, go home again as sons and daughters in the household of God. For while a tenderized conscience is prerequisite to renewal, it can also be the precursor of destruction. We know enough about the human psyche to know that a guilty conscience per se is one of the most lethal conditions which can exist in the human personality. Life and the literature of life abound in examples of how the burdened conscience can twist and crunch and obliterate. Frenzied activity, self-atonement, aggressiveness, defensiveness, hopelessness, despair, suicide, all our attempts to repeat Lady Macbeth's tragic effort trying to rub her hands even with the perfumes of Araby and saying, out damn spot, but with no success. The only remedy for a guilty conscience is forgiving love. That is why the message of Jesus is so essential today when the errors of our individual and collective lives seem to damn us to die like grunting swine. We can go home again as accepted persons, if we will. Home again to live in celebration of all the riches a gracious Father can bestow and in the assumption that our humanness is accepted and forgiven. I have said your generation has awakened the conscience of our society. I have said that out of such a state can come renewal. Perhaps this can provide us with the clue to the mission of a Christian college. For with the education of the intellect in the arts and sciences, 
and with whatever cultivation of talent and skill is deemed essential for the enrichment of our life and service, the education of the conscience must, I believe, be likewise included. Only thus can this college fulfill the essence of its stated mission, namely to contribute to the true good of society. For the conscience must indeed be educated, and educated it will be by whatever forces we choose to shape its character. We have long since abandoned the naive notion, let your conscience be your guide. The question is not, does your conscience guide you, but what guides your conscience? A Nazi general responsible for the efficient destruction of thousands of Jews said recently that he did not act contrary to his conscience because he believed he was doing his duty in following the orders of his superiors. In short, his conscience was educated to place the obedience to orders above the murder of innocents. Education which neglects the education of the conscience is engaged in the risky business of supplying society with clever devils. But how, you ask, can we educate the conscience? Happily at a college.